a look at module four, where we're going to explore data analytic solutions in Azure. So first, we're going to take a look at what a modern data warehouse looks like. We're going to then take a look at some of the data ingestion services in Azure. We're also going to explore some of the data storage and processing capabilities in Azure. And finally, we'll wrap up with some Microsoft Power BI. So let's get started with module four. Lesson one, examine components of a modern data warehouse. So the data from relational and non-relational services is retrieved and formatted by using Azure Data Factory. This process is known as ingestion. The formatted data is then written to Azure Data Lake Storage. Now Azure Data Lake Storage enables you to store large volumes of data quickly and easily prior to analyzing it. At this point, the data can proceed down two paths. So the data is converted into a normalized format suitable for analysis and can be stored into Azure Synapse Analytics services. Alternatively, you can use Azure Databricks to perform other forms of data preparation. For example, you might need to perform additional data transformations or cleaning to remove anomalies and generally tidy up the data set. You can then store the clean data using Synapse Analytics if you require it. Now, Azure Synapse Services acts as a hub holding this cleaned business data. You can then perform a detailed analysis of the analytics uh, that the data has been cleaned and processed into using Azure Analysis Services. So Azure Analysis Services enables you to dig deeper into the data and generate insights from the information it contains. Then Microsoft Power BI can take this information and use it to generate graphs, charts and reports. And Power BI can also run ad hoc queries against the data processed by Databricks. Now, a modern data warehouse might contain a mixture of relational and non-relational data, including files, social media streams, and Internet of Things or IoT sensor data. Azure provides a collection of services you can then use to build a data warehouse solution, including Azure Data Factory, Azure Data Lake Storage, Azure Data Bricks, Azure Synapse Analytics, and Azure Analysis Services. And you can also use tools like Power BI to analyze and visualize the data, generating reports, charts, and dashboards. Now, a typical large scale business requires a combination of up to the second data and historical information. So the up to the second data might be used to help monitor real time critical manufacturing processes, for example, where an instant decision is needed to be made. Now, other examples include uh, streams of stock market data where the current prices might be required to make informed split second buy or sell decisions on the stock market. Historical data is equally important because it gives a business a more stabilized view of the trends and how it's performing over time. So, for example, a manufacturing organization uh, might require information about the volume of sales by product across a month or a quarter or a year to determine whether to continue producing uh, certain items, whether to increase or decrease production according to seasonal fluctuations and all that kind of stuff. So historical data can be used to generate insights to help make those business decisions. Now, historical data are generally batch processed at regular intervals. So they could be based on live sales data that might be captured through a continuous stream. And then we capture them into batches and then submit it to a batch shop to be processed one batch at a time. Or multiple batches at a time. Now, any modern data warehouse solutions must also be able to provide access to streams of raw data and the process information that is derived from this raw data. 
Azure Data Factory is a data integration service. So the main purpose of Azure Data Factory is to retrieve data from one or more data sources, convert it into a format that you can then process. So the data sources might contain data in various formats and types. So it could contain a lot of noise that you need to first filter out. So using Azure Data Factory, you can extract out and filter out uh, some of those data so that you can keep the relevant and interesting data and throw out the rest. Now, even the interesting data might not be in a suitable format for processing by some of your other services in your data warehouse solution. And so typically you need to also transform it. For example, your data might contain dates and times that's been formatted in different formats, and so you need to standardize that. You can use Azure Data Factory to transform some of these items into a single uniform structure. And then Azure Data Factory can then write out the ingested data to a data store for subsequent processing. So you typically define the work performed by Azure Data Factory as a pipeline of operations. And this pipeline can run continuously or as data is uh, received from a data source. So you can create these pipelines using the graphical user interface inside Azure Data Factory, or you can write your own code. Now, a data lake is a repository for large quantities of raw data. Because the data is raw and unprocessed, it's very fast to load and update, but the data hasn't been put into a structure suitable for efficient analysis. So you can think of a data lake as a staging point for your ingested data before it's then massaged and converted into a format suitable for performing analytics. Now, the difference between a data warehouse and a data lake storage is that data warehouse stores large quantities of processed data and a data lake storage stores large quantities of raw data that needs to be processed and converted into a format that supports efficient analysis. Now, Azure Data Lake Storage combines that hierarchical directory structure and file systems of a traditional file system that you might be familiar with, with the uh, security and scalability uh, features provided by Azure. And so Azure Data Lake Storage is essentially an extension of Azure Blob Storage organized into a near infinite file system. Azure Databricks is an Apache Spark environment running on Azure to provide that big data processing, streaming, and machine learning capabilities. So Apache Spark is a highly efficient data processing engine that can consume and process large amounts of data very, very quickly. So there are a significant amount of Spark libraries you can use to perform tasks like SQL processing, aggregations, um, or even to build and train your own machine learning models using the data through Azure Databricks. So Azure Databricks provides a graphical user interface where you can define and test your processing step by step before submitting it as a set of batch tasks. So you can create Databricks scripts and query data using languages like R, Python, and Scala. You can also write your Spark code using notebooks. So a notebook contains cells, and each of these cells contains a separate block of code. So when you run a notebook, the code in each cell is then passed to, this, to, to Spark uh, for execution, cell by cell. Now, Azure Databricks also supports structured stream processing. So Databricks can be used to perform computations incrementally. So as your continuous stream of data arrives, we can continuously update results from the continuous stream of data. Azure Synapse Analytics is an analytics engine. So it's designed to process large amounts of data very quickly. Using Synapse Analytics, you can ingest data from external sources. So these external sources could be flat files, Azure Data Lake, or some of your Azure, uh, some of your database management systems, 
and then transform and aggregate this data into a format that's suitable for analytics processing. You can then perform very complex queries over this data and then generate reports, graphs and charts from the results. Now, reading and transforming data from an external source can take a lot of resources, which is why Azure Synapse Analytics enables you to store the data that you have written and process it locally within the service. So this approach enables you to repeatedly query the same data without the overhead of fetching and converting it uh, each time. So you can also use this data as input to then further your analytical processing using Azure Analysis Services. Azure Analysis Services leverages a massively parallel processing architecture. So this architecture includes uh, control nodes and uh, it enables you to build tabular models to support your online analytical processing queries. So you can combine data from multiple sources like Azure SQL Database, Azure Synapse Analytics, Azure Data Lake Storage, uh, Azure Cosmos DB and many, many other more. And then you can use these data sources to build models that incorporate your business knowledge. So a model is essentially a set of queries and expressions that retrieve data from the various data sources and that can be then used to generate results. So the results can then be cached in memory for later use or they can uh, be calculated dynamically or directly from the underlying data sources. Now, Analysis Services includes a graphical designer to help you connect data sources together and define queries that combine, filter, and aggregate data. So you can explore this data from within Analysis Services, or you can use tools like Microsoft Power BI to help visualize the data presented by these models. So, Azure Analysis Services has a bit of overlap with Azure Synapse Analytics, but it's actually more suited for processing uh, data on a much smaller scale. So typically we use uh, Azure Analysis Services for small volumes of data, so a couple of terabytes, for example. Uh, we also use Azure Analysis Services to correlate multiple sources. Uh, it supports high reconcurrency so that you can have thousands of users connect to it at the same time. Um, it also supports detailed analysis so that you can really drill into your data or use functions from Power BI to be able to get that detailed insight into your data. You can also create very rapid dashboards uh, from your data using Azure Analysis Services. So a lot of scenarios actually benefit from combining the use of Synapse Analytics and uh, Analysis Services together. So let's say you've got a large amount of ingested data that require pre-processing. So typically you would use Synapse Analytics to read this data, manipulate it into a model that contains the business information rather than the large amount of raw data. And then you can use uh, analysis services to really investigate and get insights and drill down into uh, some of these business models and uh, information. Now, the scalability of Synapse Analytics also uh, gives Synapse the ability to process, uh, you know, terabytes of data into smaller succinct data sets uh, that summarizes and aggregates a lot of this data, then which you can use uh, Azure Analysis Services to then perform that detailed interrogation uh, of this information. And then you can visualize the results uh, through Power BI. So Azure HD Insight is a big data processing service that provides a platform for technologies such as Spark in an Azure environment. So HD Insight implements a cluster model that distributes processing across a set of computers. And this model is similar to the, the one used by uh, Synapse Analytics, except the nodes are running Spark processing engine rather than Azure SQL database. So you can use uh, Azure HD Insight in conjunction with uh, Azure Synapse Analytics. 
So as well as Spark, HD Insight also supports streaming technologies like Apache Kafka and Apache Hadoop. So Hadoop is an open source framework that breaks large data processing problems down into smaller chunks and distributes them across a cluster of servers, sort of in a similar way that Synapse Analytics operates. Now, Azure HD Insight also supports Apache Hive, which is a SQL-like query facility that you can use uh, within an HD Insight cluster to examine the data that's held in uh, different formats. And then you can use it to create, load, and query external tables in a similar way that you would use Polybase uh, for in Azure Synapse Analytics. Lesson two, explore data ingestion in Azure. So data ingestion is typically the first part of any data warehousing solution. It's arguably the most important parts because if you lose any data at this point, then any resulting information can be inaccurate, uh, could fail to represent the facts that you might be interested in that you're basing your business uh, decisions on. And so in the big data system, data ingestion has to be fast enough so that you can capture almost all the data that might be relevant and that's heading your way. And so you also need enough compute power to be able to process this data in a timely manner. Now we can ingest data using Azure Data Factory. So as it ingests the data, Data Factory will clean, transform and restructure the data before loading it into a repository like a data warehouse. Because once the data is inside a data warehouse, we can analyze it. So we need to ensure that before we load it in, the data is actually ready for those analytics workloads. So Data Factory contains a series of interconnected systems that provides a complete end-to-end -end platform for data engineers. So you can load static data, but you can also ingest streaming data. Loading data from a stream offers those real-time solutions for data that arrives quickly or that changes rapidly. So using streaming, you can uh, use Azure Data Factory to continuously update the information in the data warehouse with the latest data. We can also ingest data using Polybase. So Polybase is a feature of SQL Server and Azure Synapse Analytics that enables you to run Transact SQL or T-SQL queries that read data from external data sources. So Polybase makes use of these uh, external data sources and makes them appear like tables in a SQL database. So using Polybase, we can read data managed by Hadoop, by Spark, by Azure Blob Storage, and other database systems like Cosmos DB, Oracle, uh, Teradata, and MongoDB. Polybase also enables you to transfer data from an external data source into a table, as well as copy data from an external data source in Azure Synapse Analytics or SQL Server. You can also run queries that join tables in a SQL database with the external data, which enables you to perform analytics that span multiple data sources. We can also ingest data using SQL Server integration services. So SQL Server Integration Services, or SSIS, is a platform for building enterprise-level data integration and data transformation solutions. You can use SSIS to solve uh, complex business problems by copying or downloading files, loading data warehouses, cleaning and mining data, and managing SQL database objects and data. Now, SSIS is actually part of Microsoft SQL Server. And so with SSIS, we can extract and transform data from a variety of data sources, such as uh, XML data files, flat files, uh, relational data sources, and then load the data into one or more destinations. You can use the graphical uh, tool that's provided by SSIS to create these solutions without having to write a single line of code. And you can also uh, program extensive integration services, uh, service object models to create packages programmatically and code custom tasks 
and uh, other package objects as well. So SSIS is typically used as an on-premises utility. However, you can also uh, use Azure Data Factory to run your existing SSIS packages as part of the Data Factory pipeline in Azure. And so this allows you to quickly get started uh, on uh, building your Azure Data Factory pipelines using your existing SSIS packages without having to rewrite some of that transformation logic. Now, Azure Data Factory uses a number of different resources like link services, uh, data sets, and uh, pipelines. So with link services, Data Factory moves data from a data source to a destination. So a link service provides the information needed for Data Factory to connect to a source or a destination. For example, you can use Azure Blob Storage link service to connect the storage account to Data Factory or the Azure SQL database link service to connect to a SQL database. A pipeline is a logical grouping of activities that together perform a task. And so the activities in the pipeline define actions to perform on your data. For example, uh, you might use the copy activity to transform data from a source data set to a destination data set. You could also include activities that transform the data as it is uh, being transferred, or you might combine the data from multiple sources together. So pipelines don't have to be linear. You can include logic activities that repeatedly perform a series of tasks while uh, some condition is true using, for example, a for each activity or follow different processing paths depending on the outcome of uh, previous pr uh, processing outcome using an if condition activity. You can run a pipeline manually or you can arrange it to be run later on using a trigger. A trigger enables you to schedule a pipeline to occur accordingly to a, a planned schedule. So say, for example, um, we can trigger a pipeline to run every Saturday night or at repeated intervals. So we can also trigger a pipeline to run uh, every minute or every hour or when an event occurs. So for example, when a file gets landed into Azure Data Lake Storage or a blob gets deleted from Azure Blob Storage. Now, data sets in Azure Data Factory represents the data that you want to ingest. So the input data and store, so the output data. If your data has a structure, uh, a data set specifies how the data is structured. So not all data sets are structured. Blobs held in Azure Blob Storage, for example, are unstructured data. And so a data set connects to an input or an output using a link service. For example, if you're reading and processing data from Azure Blob Storage, you create an input data set that uses a Blob Storage linked service to specify the details of the storage accounts. The data set will specify which blob to ingest um, and the format of the information in the blob. So is it binary, is it JSON, is it delimited text? Uh, if you're using Azure Data Factory to store data in the table in a SQL database, for example, you would then define an output data set that uses the SQL database link service to connect to that database and specify which table to uh, use in that database to output the data to. Lesson three, exploring data storage and processing in Azure. So data lives in many locations throughout an organization. When you design your cloud data solution, you'll want to ingest your raw data into a data store for analysis. So a common approach that you can use with Azure Synapse Analytics is to extract the data from where it's currently stored, load the data into an analytical data store, and then transform the data and shaping it so that it's ready for analysis. Now, Azure Synapse Analytics is particularly suitable for this approach. Using Apache Spark and automated pipelines, Synapse Analytics can run 
parallel processing tasks across a massive data set and perform big data analytics. Remember, the term big data here refers to data that is too large or too complex for traditional database systems. So systems that process big data need to perform rapid data ingestion as well as processing, which means they need to have the capacity to store the results uh, as well as sufficient compute power to perform those analytics over the results. Now, Azure Databricks, as I mentioned, is an analytics platform that's been optimized for Azure. So Azure Databricks was actually designed by some of the founders of Apache Spark. So Databricks is integrated with Azure to provide a one-click setup uh, so that we can streamline the workflows and provide an interactive workspace that enables collaboration between data scientists, data engineers, and business analysts. So with Databricks, we can process data held in a lot of different types of storage, including Azure Blob Storage, Data Lake Storage, Hadoop Storage, Flat Files, uh, databases, and data warehouses. Databricks can also process streaming data. So Databricks uses an extensible architecture that's based on drivers to do so. The processing engine is provided by Apache Spark. So Spark is a parallel processing engine that supports, that supports large-scale analytics. So you typically write application code that consumes data from one or more sources and uh, merge, reformat, and filter, and remodel this data, and then sort the results. So Spark distributes the work across a cluster of uh, computers, and each of the computer can then process its data in parallel with other computers. And so this would actually reduce the time required to perform the work. And so Spark is designed to handle massive quantities of data. You can write your Spark application code using a couple languages. So Spark supports a Python, R, Scala, Java, and SQL. Spark also has a number of libraries uh, for these languages, and some of these libraries include modules for machine learning, statistical analysis, linear and non-linear modeling, predictive analytics, uh, and graphics so that it can support uh, complex analytics tasks as well as optimizing your workload for a cluster environment. Now, you typically design your application or write your uh, Databricks applications using a notebook. So again, a notebook would contain a series of uh, cells. Each cell will contain a block of code. So for example, one cell might contain code that connects to a data source. The next cell will then read the data from the source, convert it into a model and memory, and then the cell after that could plot a graph. And the final cell after that could then save the data from the in-memory model to a repository. Now, Azure Synapse uh, Analytics uh, is made up of a couple of components. So there is the Synapse SQL pool, there is the Synapse Spark pool, there are Synapse pipelines, Synapse link, as well as the Synapse Studio. So with Synapse SQL pool, this is a collection of servers running Transact SQL or TSQL. So Transact SQL, if you remember, is a dialect of SQL that's used by Azure SQL uh, database as well as Microsoft SQL Server. So you can typically write your data processing logic using TSQL and uh, execute it on, an, on a Synapse SQL pool. Now Synapse Spark is a cluster of servers running Apache Spark to process data. So you can write your data processing logic using uh, either Python, Scala, SQL, uh, or C Sharp. So um, C Sharp uh, has um, in .NET there is libraries which um, supports Apache Spark. So Spark pools can also support Azure Machine Learning through integration with uh, Spark ML or Azure ML packages. Now, Synapse Pipeline 
is a logical grouping of activities that together perform a task. So the activities in the pipeline uh, define actions to perform on your data. So for example, you might uh, use a copy activity to transform data from a source data set to a destination data set. You could include activities that transform the data as it is transferred, or you might combine the data from multiple uh, data sources together as part of the pipeline. Now, Azure Synapse Link is a component that allows you to connect to some of the other Azure uh, services like Cosmos DB, for example, so that you can uh, use it to perform near real-time analytics over uh, operational data that's stored inside a Cosmos DB database. And Azure Synapse Studio is uh, a web user interface that enables data engineers to access all these uh, Synapse Analytics tools. So you can use Synapse Studio to create your Spark uh, or SQL pools. You can use uh, Synapse Studio to define and run your uh, Synapse pipelines, or you can use the Synapse Studio to configure links to uh, some of your external data sources. Now let's have a look at a demo where we load data into an Azure Synapse Analytics. So imagine that you're part of a team that is analyzing house price data. So the data set that you receive contains house price information for several regions, and your team might need to report on how the house prices in each of those regions vary over the last couple of months. So to achieve this, we can ingests the data into Azure Synapse Analytics um, and we would use Azure Data Factory to perform this task. So let me just jump into my Azure portal to show you how we go about this. Now that I'm back in my Azure portal, the first thing I want to create is a storage account. So I'm just going to look up storage account and let me just create a storage account. I'm going to put it into my demo resource group. There you go. And I'm going to call this housing storage account. That's pretty unique. I am going to put it into the East US Azure region and uh, I'm going to leave mo most of the default. I'm going to change it to locally redundant storage and I'm just going to go review and create because what I really want to create is an Azure file storage in my storage account. So we'll go create. Now, while my storage account is being created, uh, I'm going to go and also set up a Synapse Analytics. So I'm going to look up Synapse and I want to select Azure Synapse Analytics, the workspaces preview. I'm going to go hit add. And again, I provide some basic credentials, so I'm going to put it into the demo resource group. Now I need to give my Synapse Analytics a name, so I'm just going to call this Demo Synapse Analytics. That checks out. I'm going to put it into the SUS region again, and now I need to create a data lake storage because I don't have one. So I'm going to go create new going to call this demo data lake. Oh, someone's taking that. So uh, data lake housing. There we go. Now I also need to give it a file system name, so I'm just going to create a new one. Let's call it logs. I can also assign myself the storage blob data contributor on the data lake storage Gen2 account. So I'm going to check that. Now I can go into security and I need to provide it some SQL administrator credentials. So would recommend changing this default admin username, but I'm just going to leave the default and put in a password. Again, I'm going to repeat that password. Uh, I'm just going to hit next and uh, you can configure to allow connections from all IP addresses or disable it from here. I'm going to skip tags. I'm going to go into summary and then I'm just going to hit create. 
Now, while our Synapse Analytics is being created, let's check on our deployment from our storage account. So our storage account has created, let's go to that resource. So let me just go back to that resource. There we go. Now I'm gonna scroll on the left here and I'm gonna go find file storage. So file services and then under file shares, what I'm gonna do is create a new file share and I'm gonna just call this file share housing. I'm gonna allocate it some quota, select the hot here, I'm gonna go create. Now my file share has been created, I'm gonna go into my file share and I'm just gonna upload a file I have on my local PC. So I'm gonna upload files, select the file. There we go. I'm gonna select the CSV file and then I'm gonna go upload. And now it's been uploaded. So um, it looks like our Synapse Analytics is still being created. So why don't we use this time to go create a data factory? So I'm gonna look up data factories and I'm gonna go add. Now I'm gonna use my internal subscription, put it into my demo resource group. Then I'm gonna pick that same region I used earlier for the other two resources, so ECUS. I'm gonna give my data factory a name. So I'm gonna call this demo ADF, for example. Oh, that's not available, okay. ADF demo. Let's call it housing as well. And you can select between two versions for data factory. Obviously version two is the latest version. So I'm just gonna leave it as this. Now I'm gonna go to next for Git configuration. So you can configure uh, your repository to be either Azure DevOps or GitHub for version control. I'm gonna do the setup later. So I'm just gonna tick the configure Git later box, go to networking. Again, you can select your connectivity method. I'm gonna leave the public endpoint for now. I'm gonna skip tags and just go review and create. So create that. And let's check on our Synapse Analytics. So if I go to that resource group called Demo, I can find all the resources that I've just created. So let me filter by name. And there you go. So um, I've got my storage account, my Synapse workspace, and uh, Oh, so the data lake that I created, data lake storage and the storage account and the Synapse Analytics workspace. So let me just go into the Synapse Analytics workspace. So it says the resource is being provisioned at the moment, which is fine because I have actually set one up before this so that we don't have to wait. So let me go and find the one that I set up before. It's under the DP900 resource group. And I'm gonna scroll a little bit to find that Synapse Analytics workspace. There you go. Now this one's called the MyDP900 Synapse. And uh, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna scroll down on the overview page a little bit and open that Synapse Studio. So once provisioned, this is what we want to open up. So the Synapse Analytics Workspace Studio. And from the left-hand side, I can access my data. And I've set up one database in my SQL pool. So let's have a look. I've called it my Synapse SQL. And inside this database, I have one table at the moment called housing data. So that's what we wanna set up in our Synapse Analytics that we are currently deploying. So let's just go check out how the progress is. Again, I'm gonna go back into my resource group and go find my Synapse Analytics. It looks like our Synapse Analytics has been provisioned now, just then. So what I'm gonna do is from here, go add a new SQL pool. And I need to create a SQL pool. So I'm gonna give my SQL pool a name. So demo SQL pool. I'm gonna scale this right down just because it's a demo, uh, but you can 
you know, increase the performance level um, as you need. Now I'm going to go to additional settings. I can configure you know, what data source to set up my SQL pool. Uh, I'm going to choose none and I'm just going to skip tags and go straight to review and create. And I'm just going to create that. Now again, that's going to take a couple of moments to uh, provision. So once that's provisioned, I'm going to open up the Synapse Analytics workspace and from there I'm going to create uh, that data, that table called housing data so that I can eventually ingest my data stored in that file share into my Synapse Analytics. So our SQL pool just finished uh, being deployed. So let's go to our Synapse Analytics workspace. I'm going to click go to resource and from here I'm going to go and open up the Synapse Studio. Now once our Synapse Studio Analytics workspace has opened up, let's go into the data section and open up databases. And we can see that demo SQL pool that we had just created. So what I want to do is I actually want to go and create a table. So I'm going to go to new SQL script and empty script. And uh, what I want to do is I actually want to execute a table on this uh, database. So I'm going to go create a table. I'm going to enter this predefined script that I had earlier. So this is going to create the housing data table with fields like geo name, month, average price, etc. And I'm just going to hit run. So we can see the query being executed here it took, you know, um, three second, three millisecond to execute successfully. Now um, our table is now inside our uh, SQL pool database. So we can see it here. So now I'm going to go back to my Azure portal and I am going to now search for my data factory that I had created earlier. There we go. AD ADF demo housing is the data factory I had just created live. I'm going to go into this and uh, from here I'm going to go and click into author and monitor. This is going to open up my Azure data factory for me. Now from my Azure data factory I can create pipelines, I can create data fo flows, I can create pipelines from a template, I can copy data, I can configure SSIS integration or set up code repository. So I'm going to copy data and I need to specify a couple of things. So I'm going to call this my demo copy pipeline. I can give it a description and I'm just going to select run once now, hit next. Now I need to create a source data store. So I'm going to create a new connection and I'm going to look up the file storage where I've uploaded my housing data as a file. I'm going to hit continue and I'm just going to call this my Azure file storage. I can give it a description. Um, so I'm going to use the integration runtime and uh, the way that I'm going to access it is I'm going to use the user connection string. So from the Azure subscription, I need to pick my internal subscription. There you go. And I need to find that storage account name. So I believe I called it a uh, housing storage account and that's going to load that key. I'm going to find that file share, so called housing, and then I can go create. And that's going to create a connection to my Azure file storage. Now I'm going to go next. And then I'm going to go and find that file in my file share. So I'm going to go browse. And there you go, houseprices.csv. I'm going to choose that. Now um, we can configure other settings, but I'm just going to leave them for now and go next. And uh, now I just specify the file format settings. So 
Um, it's going to be text format. There's other formats that uh, it supports. Because it's a CSV file, it's going to be um, a comma column delimiter. And um, I can configure other things. So I'm just going to go next. We get to see a little preview of what that data looks like. Now I need to configure a destination data store. So the destination is going to be our Synapse. So I'm going to go create a new connection and I'm going to look up my Synapse that I had just created. Here we go, Synapse Analytics and continue. Now I'm going to call this my Azure Synapse Analytics. Again, I can give it a description. I need to connect to my Synapse. So let's just look up the instance I created. So I called it Demo Synapse Analytics, and the database is that Demo SQL pool. Now I also need to authenticate to it, so I'm going to call this, I'm going to authenticate to it. And give it the password. And then I can test connection here, just to check that it is successful to connect to my Synapse Analytics. I'm going to hit Create. And now I've created a connection to my Azure Synapse Analytics. So I'm just going to hit next. Okay, so now I need to map my, uh, essentially my CSV data to my Synapse Analytics. So let's see if we can use existing table. And I'm going to select housing data. So this is the one that I want to map the files in my Azure file storage to the housing data table in my Azure Synapse Analytics. I'm going to go next. And we can see some of that column mappings. So everything in my housing data file uh, specified as a string type. And then everything in my Azure Synapse Analytics table that has its own type. So varchar, char, int, and int, and int for the remaining columns. I can also specify a pre-copy script in other uh, settings as well. But I'm just going to leave that for now and go next. Uh, here I can, for example, enable staging, uh, configure fault tolerance, um, and specify the copy met method like polybase, copy command, or bulk insert. I'm going to select bulk insert. And uh, I'm going to disable staging for now. And I can also um, specify the degree of uh, copy parallelism. Um, and here we can also specify the data integration units. So for now it's auto, so it's going to be automatically detected, but we can also manually pick one of these for our data integration units. I'm just going to leave it as auto and I'm going to go next. Finally, this is a summary of you know, the copying process from Azure File Storage to our Azure Synapse Analytics. So once we review this, we just go next. And that is going to start that copying process. So we're validating it, creating data sets, creating pipelines, and now we're running that pipeline. And it looks like we've just finished. So let's just hit finish. And we go back to our Synapse Analytics workspace here. So now what I want to do is I just want to hit a little refresh. So let's do refresh. And then this data should be copied into our demo SQL pool database uh, table. So the housing data table. So I'm just going to drill into the table. And then from here, I'm just going to let's check out the top 100 rows to see if the data has been successfully copied over. And there you go. We see that the data is now in our housing data table. Lesson four, getting started with building uh, Power BI. So Microsoft Power BI is a collection of software services, apps and connectors that work together to turn your unrelated sources of data into a coherent, uh, visually immersive and interactive insights. 
So whether your data is simply held inside a, an Excel uh, spreadsheet or it's data that's inside um, either a cloud base or on-premises data warehouse, Power BI allows you to easily connect to any one of your data sources and visualize or discover what's inside the data and share that with anyone who wants it. So Power BI can be a very simple and fast way to create quick insights from your Excel spreadsheets or a local database, or it could be used to create robust and enterprise grade uh, models that supports real time analytics. So you can use Power BI to create you know, personal reports and visualization, but it can also serve as an analytics and decision engine uh, behind group projects, uh, divisions, or an entire organization. So Power BI consists of a couple of uh, components. So there is the Power BI desktop um, and the Power BI servers, as well as Power BI mobile app. So the Power BI desktop is a, Win, uh, a Microsoft Windows desktop application. Power BI servers is an online SaaS or software as a service service. And the Power BI mobile app is essentially a mobile app that runs on uh, either Windows, iOS or Android mobile operating systems. So each of these three elements, so desktop, service and mobile apps are designed to let people create, share, and consume business insights in the way that serves them the best. So for example, you might be a user who view reports and dashboards in Power BI service, or you might be the one who uh, are creating those uh, number crunching business reports uh, through Power BI desktop, and then publishing those reports to either Power BI servers or the Power BI mobile app so that other users uh, can view and consume and use them. So that you know one of your colleagues, say for example, in uh, sales might then uh, use the Power BI mobile app to then you know, monitor the progress of, uh, say for example, their sales quota and drill into new sales leads and all that kind of stuff. Now, Power BI generally follows a common flow. So the common flow of, of activities uh, looks something like um, this. So you might bring data into Power BI desktop and create a report. Then you publish to the Power BI servers where you can then create a new visualization or build dashboards from. And then you can share these dashboards with uh, other people, uh, typically through either uh, the Power BI mobile app so that people can actually, or users can actually view and interact with these shared dashboards and reports. So as a Power BI user, you might spend all your time in the Power BI servers, viewing the visuals and reports that's been uh, made by others. Um, or you might be a user that spends all their time in Power BI desktop creating and building those reports out as well. Or you could be a user that only interacts with the Power BI mobile app to uh, get those insights and drill down into some of the information uh, presented by some of the results that's been visualized or, or uh, created into a report through Power BI. Now, everything you do in Microsoft Power BI can be broken down into a few basic building blocks. So these building blocks are visualizations, data sets, reports, dashboards, and tiles. So a visualization, also called a visual, is a visual representation of data, like a chart or a color-coded map or any other interesting things that you can create to uh, visually represent your data. So Power BI has all sorts of visualization types that you can use. Now visualizations can be quite simple. So it could be a single digit number or a single number that represents something sig significant, or they could be quite visually complex, like a gradient colored map that shows uh, voter sentiments about a certain social issue or concern. The main goal of a visual is really to present data in the way that provides context, insights, 
both uh, that could uh, otherwise be quite difficult to gather from a raw table of uh, numbers or text. Now, data sets is a collection of data that Power BI uses to create its visualizations. So you can have a simple data set that's based on a single table from a Microsoft Excel uh, spreadsheet. Uh, data sets can also be uh, a combination of many different sources, so which you can filter and uh, combine to provide a unique collection of data or uh, a data set for use in Power BI. So for example, you can create a data set from three database fields, uh, for example, one uh, website table, an Excel table, and, an, and some online results through uh, maybe a marketing campaign through email. So combining all these data sources into one uh, data source in Power BI is considered a single data set. Now, in Power BI, you can also create a report, which is a collection of visualizations that appear uh, together on the same page or pages. And just like any report that you might have ever created, either for you know, a sales pitch or uh, for a school assignment, a report in Power BI is simply a collection of items that relate to one another. And so reports lets you create many visualizations uh, either in a single page or multiple pages, and uh, lets you arrange those visualizations in whatever way that you think would best tell a story with the data and with the information and insights that you've gathered. And so you might have a report about quarterly sales, you might have a report about product growth in a particular area, um, you can even create a report on the migration of um, polar bear patterns um, if you wanted to. So whatever subject uh, that you need to create a report on, Power BI allows you to gather and organize all your visualizations into one or more pages. Now with dashboards, when you're ready to create uh, to share a single page uh, from a report or a collection of visualizations, you can create a dashboard to do so. So a dashboard is very similar to a dashboard that you might have seen in a car, for example. So a Power BI dashboard is a collection of visuals from a single page that you can then share with others. And often it's uh, selected groups of visuals that provide very quick insights into the data or the story that you're trying to present uh, with the data. And so a dashboard must fit into a single page. Um, often this is called a canvas. So a canvas is essentially a blank backdrop in the Power BI desktop or servers where you can put visualizations onto. So you can think of it like the same canvas that an artist or a painter might use to create their art or paint. Um, so a dashboard is that workspace where you can create and combine and rework some of those uh, very interesting and compelling visuals and put together a story into a sort of single page dashboard that you can then share with others so that they can view and interact with it. Uh, either through the Power BI service or through the Power BI mobile app. Now tiles is uh, in Power BI a single visualization on a report or a dashboard. So it's typically a rectangular box that holds an individual uh, visual. So when you're creating a report or a dashboard in Power BI, you can move or arrange the tiles uh, however you want. You can make them bigger, you know, you can change the height or the width, you can, um, you can sort of group them with other tiles if you wanted to. Now, when you're viewing or you're consuming either a dashboard or a report, which means you're not typically the creator or the owner of that particular report or dashboard, um, but someone has actually created it and shared it with you, you can interact with it, but you can't typically change uh, the format of uh, some of these tiles. So you can't change the size of the tiles or the arrangement of these tiles. So just to sum it up, Power BI is a collection of uh, services, apps, and connectors that lets you connect to your data uh, wherever it might happen to reside. 
um, and you can filter, do some filtering if necessary, and you can then bring it into your uh, Power BI to uh, create those compelling visualizations and dashboards and reports and uh, story with your data that you can then share with others. So for some people, you know, using a single Excel uh, spreadsheet or table in a data set uh, and then sharing that through a dashboard with the team um, could be, you know, one way to use Power BI. For others, the value of Power BI might be actually using that, uh, using real-time Azure SQL database tables, um, combining that with other databases and real-time sources and building that sort of moment-by-moment -moment, uh, data set. And so, so uh, whatever group you might fit into, the process is the same. We can use Power BI to create data sets, to build compelling visuals and share it with others. And the result is also the same for both groups. So you can really harness the uh, ever expanding world of data and turn it into actionable insights. So whether your data insights require straightforward or complex data sets, Power BI supports that and Power BI can help you very quickly get started and expand as your needs and your scope expands and as that complexity in your data expands as well. And because Power BI is a Microsoft product, you can count on the fact that it's a robust, extensible and Microsoft friendly uh, product that is enterprise ready. Wow, so this concludes the training for Microsoft Virtual Training Day for Data Fundamentals. So let's have a look at everything we've covered in this training. We started with module one, where we covered core data concepts. Then we had a look at module two, which explored relational data in Azure. And then we had a look at module three, where we explored non-relational data in Azure, as well as module four, where we had a look at some of the data analytics solutions in Azure. So thank you for taking part in both part one and part two of this Microsoft Azure Virtual Training Day for Data Fundamentals. Now, just remember, you can continue your learning journey we have a great variety of resources, such as the Microsoft Learn platform, where we offer self-paced learning paths for you to take your learning journey further. So I wish you all the best for your exams and happy studying.